My name is John DeMellis. I'm the interim dean of the Lapenta School of Business. I want to welcome everybody here, uh, especially our uh, distinguished guest, Alan Beatty. Alan is the CEO of Citrin Cooperman. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Alan will correct me when I get this wrong, and his partner in the front row here. Uh, Citrin Cooperman is one of the nation's largest professional services firm, approximately 400 partners, 2,800 or so professionals, Alan. It changes every day because they've been on an acquisition it's spree. In the last 15 minutes. Right. <laughs> so they're always doing an acquisition, so it's kind of hard to get the numbers right. Uh, there's lots of accolades. I mean, Citrin is consistently uh, getting work winning awards, accolades and awards. Top 100 accounting firm by Accounting Today was number eight in Crane's New York business top accounting firm list. Well-respected uh, organization. More, most importantly to me is Citrin hires a lot of our students here from Iona, to which we are very grateful. So uh, thank you, Alan. So basically what we're gonna do tonight, I got a bunch of questions we're gonna go through with Alan and then we'll leave some opportunity for you to ask questions. But before I do that, let me give you a little bit of um, background on Alan. And again, I'm sure he'll correct me when I, I get it wrong. So Alan earned his business administration degree from some university called Pace. But we're not going to hold that against him. You guys have a better mascot. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a CPA and a chartered global management accountant, over 30 years of experience in the, the industry of public accounting. He's been CEO of Citrin Cooperman for approximately two and a half years. But prior to that, he's had many roles uh, at Citrin. Member of the AICPA and the New York State Society of CPAs for many years, so he's very engaged in the profession. Actually, Alan and I sat together on the Young CPAs Committee of the New York State Society of CPAs many years ago. Unfortunately, we no longer qualify to be Young CPAs, Alan, so we, we missed that uh, we'll leave it there. He lives in Armonk with his wife, Maria, and, and he has two grown children who no longer live with him. And he tells me they're off his payroll, but I'm not quite Almost. sure. Uh, but he's very active in the community in which he lives and, as I already mentioned, the profession. He's a big sports fan, which is good because whenever I do these things, I call audibles all the time, right? So I'm, I'm guessing that even though I shared some questions with him, that we're going to change on the fly. And so hopefully he'll be, he'll be good with that. Uh, and Alan and I have actually known each other for many, many years. He and I went to high school together. Uh, I don't remember, honestly, if he was chosen as most likely to succeed back in high school. No. Uh, but when I knew him, I knew he was going to go on to do great things. So uh, I hope you all join me in welcoming Alan uh, tonight and have some uh, good questions for him. So we're going to spend a little bit of time unpacking Alan's career a little bit. And the questions kind of go all over the place. So. Um, and he tells me nothing's off limits, right, Alan? Nothing is off limits. Nothing's Absolutely. off limits. So we're just going to start maybe with a little bit of a career progression. So um, you started at a small boutique accounting firm in White Plains, right, and worked your way. I started before that, actually. You started before? Okay, thought, go ahead. You know what I'm going to tell you guys? I'm going to tell you a story. Audible. Here, audible right now. You ready? <laughs> I didn't start as an accountant. I didn't even want to be an accountant. You guys, you guys hear me in the back, right? I didn't even want to be an accountant. My entire family's engineers, and I thought I was going to be an engineer. And I got about two years into engineering school, and I'm like, this, this sucks. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was actually too hard. I, I didn't like it. <laughs> so I changed, to, I changed to, uh, to accounting, and that's how I ended up at Pace. And uh, I said to myself, even at Pace, I said, do I really want to do accounting? I didn't even know what accounting was, to be honest with you, and didn't understand the opportunities or anything about it. But here I am, 30 whatever years later, almost 40 years later from high school. So that's scary, John. Yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> thank, thank you for putting years on it. I, was, I intentionally didn't say that. But. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and, and graduated, and I ended up a small firm in Manhattan. Oh, in Manhattan, okay. I was at Leslie Suffren and Company. Uh, Leslie Suffren was a small boutique firm in the publishing industry, and mm -hmm. they did auditing for a couple of years, and that's where I learned to audit. And uh, they had really high-end clients. The guy actually was, he was, an, he was a uh, Ernst and Ernst guy that started the firm. And uh, he brought these little clients for Ernst and Ernst. One of them was a billion and a half dollar company that we were representing. And we got some, I got some really good experience doing that. And then I ended up in White Plains at the small firm. 
And you've been at Citra now 22 plus years, something like that? Yeah, 22 years. So I was in White Plains um, for about 10 years um, at this small firm. Uh, I was, you know, I, I grew up in a house where because my dad was an engineer, we were in a weird situation, right? I, if he sold jobs, we had steak for dinner. And if he didn't sell jobs, we had peanut butter and jelly for dinner. And uh, so I learned from a very early age that, you know, having good relationships with clients and really good relationships with the community was important to the success of your career. You couldn't do it without it. So um, even at a young age, I understood I had to go out and I had to kind of develop those relationships. Even when I was learning the actual trade, I didn't even understand some of the trade itself. Um, but what happened was because I was out in, in the community and developing those relationships, I started to bring in business when I was like 24 years old, 25 years old. I made partner when I was 29 at this firm. And that's hard to, it's, I'm not, it, it's hard to do, I was in the right place at the right time. That's what allowed me to do it. Um, but that's how I got to, to, to be the, ultimately we merged into, we merged our little practice in White Plains into Citroen Cooperman and I took the office and started running with it. And so when you joined Citroen, uh, I know because you were the managing partner of the White Plains office for a while, right? So did you have a career goal of being the CEO? No. I barely had a career goal of, no. Uh, <laughs> CEO, no. Uh, I didn't, I uh, honestly, here's what, here's what I wanted when I was your age, okay? And I'll try to put myself back there. I wanted to be independent. That's what I wanted to be. I love my parents and my family, and growing up was wonderful, but I wanted to be able to support myself, and I wanted to be independent. So I was willing to work as hard as I had to work in order to be independent. I remember being probably 22, 23, 24, 25 years old and thinking, how the hell am I ever going to buy a house? Yeah, I'm sure you felt the same way. It, it was just daunting. And I said, God, I'm just going to, at some point, I'm just going to bear down and I'm going to work real hard. I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to get to wherever I can get to. I have no idea where that is. But I don't want to be dependent on anybody else. That, that was my thought process. Right. So you mentioned relationships, right, in that you, you were out running around and developing relationships. What did you do to foster those relationships? How did you develop them? Yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a couple of things in this profession that, quite frankly, probably apply to most of the things in, in, that you're going to do in your life, right? And one of them is understanding that showing up is 80% of the game. If you, if you go home and, and you watch TV at night or you play video games at night, that's cool, but you're, you're, you're never going to get to where you ultimately want to be. So I made it my, my thing to get out and to meet people. Right, as John said, and uh, you know, he and I reconnected after knowing each other in high school, you know, a long time ago. We connected when we started the Young CPAs group with the New York State Society, and that gave me a springboard to really meet the bankers, meet the attorneys, meet the insurance people, meet all of these people in the Westchester community. And what happened was, it was slowly over time, but slowly over time, you start to really know everybody, and they start to know you too. And if you even just have a a person, it's like making friends, right? You, you meet somebody, you don't, you're not best friends with them overnight, but over a period of time, you really get to know the people. And what happens is, is that um, you, there's not that many people in the business community in Westchester County, there's just not. So you, you start to see the same people over and over and over again, and they start to know who you are, and you start to know who they are, and you develop a friendship, and that friendship turns into a business relationship. Yeah, absolutely. So I know leadership, I know we're talking about we're in the accounting industry, right? But uh, leadership applies to any industry, right? So um, obviously something that's very important for your role as the CEO. So can you spend a little bit of time talking about your leadership style and, and what guides your approach every day and how you're running your organization? Yeah, so there's a, <laughs> there's a couple of different leadership styles, okay? And my leadership style is actually one that is not very common. Um, I am very much a listener in the way that I lead. And I'm very much a person who is uh, trying to help 
the people that I work with get to where they want to be. So my leadership style is very much one where um, what gives me the best gratitude of my, of, of, for me is seeing other people being successful. That's not normal in the world. It's, it's a minority of, of leaders are that way. It probably stems from just how you're born and how, you're, how your brain is formed when you're, when you're born and how you're raised as a, as a person. But my leadership style is to listen. My leadership style is to execute. If we come up with a good idea, Tyler, we're gonna execute on it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Ask Anthony. We will make sure it gets done and we will make sure that we drive it and it's successful at the end of the day. But I'm not gonna ram it down your throat. I'm gonna do it in a way that's very collaborative with you and we're gonna, and we're gonna be successful together. Would you agree with that, Anthony? Anthony is my partner, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I own a limb, right? Yeah. There's, a, there's a couple here. There's a few. Thank you for that. I already touched on, Alan, that you were involved in the New York State Society and other uh, organizations, and I know you're pretty engaged in the community that you live in and throughout Westchester. How important is that? to what you do every day in terms of being engaged in the community, right? That's not necessarily running C Citroen and Cooperman, but it's giving back to the community. How important is that? Yeah, so there's two pieces to that that, that are important. Number one is is being able to, you know, the, the, to, to, to give back in a way that you're actually helping your neighbors and everything um, to get through their lives and get through their days, and that that's super important. That's the number one reason to do it. But the other is, is that it creates and fosters those relationships that are, that are not necessarily professional relationships, but what happens is it, it becomes just one community of people. And the more people that know you and have a relationship with you, the, the, the better it makes your career at the end of the day for multiple reasons. It's not just all about getting business and growing business, it's having resources. It's knowing who to go to when you have a problem. We can't solve every problem at Citroen Cooperman, but I always prided myself, if you had a problem, I could help you get to that resource that you, that you needed in order to help fix that problem. So I think it's twofold. I think it's those, both of those things. So uh, obviously you've been very successful. Were there any uh, setbacks in your career or I'll call them failures for lack of a better word? Yeah, I, um, I, I fail multiple times every single day, literally. I'm not even joking with you guys. <clears throat> I probably make a decision every 10 minutes, a big decision every 10 minutes during the day. And those decisions, I'm not talking about life altering decisions, but a material decision, right? And those decisions are ones that you ha you're never gonna be perfect making every decision quickly but not making a decision is, worth than, is worse than making the wrong decision when you're in business. So there's many things that I've done wrong and continue to do wrong, but when I make a mistake, I recognize the mistake and I fix the mistake, right? I made a mistake uh, literally yesterday, a, a big mistake, okay? And what I did today was I picked up the phone and I went and I saw the person and I fixed the mistake that I made. And you, you know, you, you, that's the way you treat people. You treat people with respect and you treat people with dignity and you treat them the way that you want to be treated. And I hate to say that came out of my mouth because my mother said it about eight million <laughs> times, but. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna call another audible now because you know, you touched on something that's near and dear to my heart. So I grew up in a professional services firm as well and spent 30 some odd years literally traveling around the world meeting face to face with my clients, right? And we live in a different world today, right? Technology has really changed the way we do business to a certain extent and we do lots of things over Zoom and so, uh, but something you just said resonated with me. You, you went to see somebody to, in this case it happened to be dealing with the mistake, but how important is that face to face communication, contact, to building those relationships that you said were so important to you? Okay, so I'm gonna get on my, on my soapbox now. <laughs> I know that
that between Instagram and Facebook and all these things, it's super easy to communicate with your friends. It's super easy to meet people. It's You guys are probably getting dates off of all of these apps and everything else. Um, but that's not the way the business world works. The business world is really built on relationships of humans together. And what happens is, is that, that the value that all of you will bring, okay, if you stick with this, the value that you will bring to your clients is not getting their audit done or getting their tax return done. That is not the value. The value that you will bring is the culmination of the experiences and the learning and the intelligence that you build over a period of time. That's super valuable. In order to trans translate that to a client, the client and you need to be together, physically together. You need to talk to each other. You need to sit in the room to each other, next to each other. You need to see each other's expressions. You need to see each other's um, inflections in your voices. You n there is a difference, us sitting here and talking and us looking at each other this way, than there is us looking across into a computer at each other. It's completely different. And I know you all know what I mean. That is how you grow a business. If you sit on one side of the screen and you talk to the other person, you devalue yourself every time you do that. I'm not saying that you can't transmit information back and forth, but it is super important. It's also super important for all of you, when you, and Matt's a great example of this, right? Matt's just out of school for a year now, right, Matt? It's hard to learn when you're sitting at home and you're just looking at a computer. When I'm sitting in the office and you can hear me talking and you're sitting outside at a desk, there's information you're getting you don't even realize you're getting. I may be having a hard conversation with a client or with a, with a staff person or another partner or whoever. You're getting the way that I'm dealing with that problem. You may not know what I'm saying, but you hear the way that I'm dealing with that problem. That's super important. That's number one. Number two is, you have a question. I can lead over to John and say, John, I, what am I supposed to do with this? I don't understand this. I can't do that at home. I might be able to call him, but then he doesn't answer the phone, and I can't find him, and it takes eight hours to figure out where that, John, can we talk, and you're texting, and you're, and you're emailing back and forth, and you can't get to the person. It's very, very bad from a learning standpoint. It's very, very bad from a relationship standpoint. And the only thing that connects us in terms of being one firm together is the culture that, 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 that we all believe in, right? You're gonna do an audit. If you do an audit at Citroen Cooperman or you do an audit at EY or you do an audit at any other firm, you're doing the same type of work, but it's the people that you're with that makes the experience for, for you, right? I like John. I like working with him every day. I come in, he teaches me. I enjoy how he teaches me. He makes me laugh. We have a good time together. That doesn't happen when you're sitting in your dining room looking into a computer. You're not getting the full experience. Both my kids, neither one of them works from home. They're both allowed to work from home. Neither one of them works from home. They both go to the office every single day. And they're both having great experiences in their lives. So I would absolutely encourage all of you, no matter where you go in your career, make the most of it and, and go be a participant in life. 80% showing up. And just an anecdote, so from my professional uh, experience, it's much easier when you got a problem to pick up the phone if you need to have a phone call, if you're not in the office, and when you know the other person on the other end of the phone personally, when you've met them. You know, it's much easier to have that difficult conversation than if you've never met before. So it's okay to 
conduct the meeting over Zoom, once you've established that relationship, that is so, so critical. You know, when I was still doing it, I had, <clears throat> I had some real issues with big clients in the firm, but I knew people from 30 years prior, and I was able to pick up the phone because I had met them at events, and, and, you know, they would help you get through issues because you had that personal connection. If you had never met somebody before, they're like, what am I going to help John for? I got no skin in the game. I don't need to help him out. So what Alan's saying is really, really critical. Uh, and so I just wanted to uh, reinforce that. But <clears throat> I kind of got to that because we were talking about technology, right? So we're all impacted uh, by technology. And technology is changing very quickly, right? We're all dealing with generative AI uh, and other technologies that are probably going to impact the accounting and, and professional services in general. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and how you see technology impacting what you do every day? Yeah. Yeah. So, so first of all, technology has been affecting this industry for the last, since I came out of school, for forever, basically forever. It's getting faster and faster and faster. That change is getting faster and faster and faster. That transformation is getting faster and faster and faster. How many of you think that there's not going to be any jobs for accountants once Gen AI takes over and makes all the decisions, does all the tax returns and everybody? Everybody think it's going to go away? Not a freaking chance. <laughs> there's not a chance, not a chance that's going to happen. Why? Will it put numbers? Will it take numbers from this piece of paper and put it into this form over here? Yes, it's going to do that for you. That's n absolutely. Is it going to check that this number ties to that number? The answer is yes, it's absolutely going to do that. And we're not going to have to type those numbers anymore. Those are going to go away. Are they going to, is the, is the generative AI going to sit down with the client, understand what they're doing with their children, how they're raising them, what they need for retirement, where they want to live, what they want to do, and then work with them on a plan on how to save money and, and, and create a retirement plan for them that they're going to work on together for the next 25 years? No. Is generative AI going to determine, um, I was a tax guy, he's an auditor, I was a tax guy. Is it going to determine what the best outcome is based on um, based on Tyler's position, taking a position in a particular investment that he's making? No, it's not going to do that. What it's going to do is it's going to do the same thing that technology has been doing for the last 40 years since I've been doing this, right? And what it's going to do is it's going to raise the bar. It's going to raise the bar on how you service your clients and at the level that you service your clients. When I came into this industry, computers were really, you know, especially the personal computers, just kind of getting started, right? So we were still, like, literally loading trunks of work papers into the back of cabs in New York City and bringing them to the clients. That's gone, right? We don't do that anymore. But what are we doing? We're, we're doing the audits at a much higher level, a much deeper level the tax complexities, the gap complexities, the gas complexities, it gets harder and harder and more complex every single day. So we're going to raise the level of expertise, the level of consultative advisory type services we're providing to the clients. Sorry, was that too long-winded? No, that's good. <laughs> so I'm gonna, cha I'm gonna change gears and go out of order, but because uh, we've been talking a lot about relationships. So I want to talk, change that a little bit and talk about mentorship. Did you have any mentors many. in your career? Yeah, Can many. Can you talk a little bit about that and how important you think mentorship is and building a network and how should, how should our folks out here in the audience do that? And Unbelievably important to find at least one or two mentors that are going to help you along the way. And um, there, it's... It's not just from a technical nature, it's from a personal development standpoint. All of you who you are today will not be who you are in 20 years from now. I promise you that. You will be a different person if you allow yourself to be a different person, if you challenge yourself to be a different person. A mentor can absolutely help show you the way to go, to, go, to, to help you demise that path of where you're trying to get to. For me, I was very business-minded, right? I was, I was always that person. 
how can this company make more money? How can our company make more money? How can we live a better lifestyle? How can we attain all the things that we want to attain in growing a business? That was just my mentality. And I was lucky enough to have people around me that I was working with that had a similar mentality, which fostered ultimately that even growing and growing and growing even more. It doesn't matter whether that's your focus. Auditing can be your focus. Tax can be your focus. Every single day, what you need to get is you need to find what that passion is inside your belly. <clears throat> Because that passion in your belly is what's going to make you get up and drive you every single day. And until you find what that is, you will never get on a path to, to ultimately what you can be in terms of successful in your, in your life or your career. And by the way, it may not be accounting. It may be something else. Like the dean of a business school, maybe? Like the dean of a business school. <laughs> <laughs> so who is your number one mentor? I think probably Cooperman was my number yeah, one okay. mentor from a business standpoint. Um, but I had a couple along the way. But Joel was just, you know, he always challenged me all the time. He still does. He's, he's, he's my chairman of the board and uh, drives me bananas. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> 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 but in a good way, you know, it's, he's challenging all the time, and that's good. So, you know, it makes you better every single day. So, but how, what kind of advice would you give our folks here to how to find a mentor? Is that something that just happened naturally, or did you specifically go start, start with searching? Start by going to the office. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think what will happen naturally is you'll start to find things that you enjoy. Right? For me, I told you guys I started out in audit, right? And I didn't really have a love of audit. It just wasn't for me. And, and probably a piece of it was my personality. And an auditor, auditor typically is, right, you're checking. You're checking what the other people are doing, right? It's, a, it's assurance, assurance servicing. We're sure, we're, we're creating assurance that the financial statements are correct, right? So in, what that means is we're, we're kind of a little bit butting heads with the clients. So that wasn't for me. Tax, on the other hand, was something that I was an advocate. I could be an advocate for the client to find the best result for them inside the tax code. So I liked that better. But I think that find the path that you have that fire and then find people you admire inside of that, of that path and they're the people you want to kind of get closer to and buddy up to and, and you know, develop that mentoring relationship. You know, Anthony's been with us how long for 12? Oh, I thought it was even longer than that. Eight years. And, and Anthony is a partner now for a couple of years. And Anthony, um, I think Mark was a pretty good mentor to you, don't you think? So one of, one of my longtime partners, and actually he and I used to run uh, our White Plains office together for a long time, uh, was, was Anthony's mentor, or one of his mentors. Still is. Still is. Yeah, that's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we found another one for you, Anthony. Don't <laughs> worry. But but um, I think I think what Mark gave Anthony probably more than anything else was time, his time to answer the questions, to talk to him in a way that that was just not fatherly, but just as a friend. Right? You, this is what you need to do to get to where you're looking to get to, and that's super important. That's what a mentor will help you do. Okay, I'm going to change gears again. I know you've hired a lot of folks in your career, right? And we were talking about before the session how rewarding it is when the people you hire, you see get promoted and make partner and so on. But when you're out there looking for folks, what specific skills or qualities do you look for? And what makes somebody, a candidate, stand out in an interview? Um, so a couple of things. It, it, first of all, it depends on what we're looking for, right? Um, to be fair, okay? So... If we're looking for a quality control person, they better have a total grasp in terms of their technical skills. But if we're looking for a candidate that's that's you know going to be a line person working with the clients, there's a couple things. Number one is you, you need to be you need to be smart. You guys have a check. You guys all have check next to that, right? You're at Iona. You're graduating from, you're getting through college. You, you've got the smarts. That's not, a, that's not an issue. 
okay? But you need to keep that going. I learn every single day. I learn something every single day. So you all never, never stop learning. That's number one. Number two is you need to develop a great open way about yourself. Your confidence, do you guys think I'm confident? Does it feel like I'm confident to you? I was not always this way. I'm telling you, I was not. not. Huh? Not true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I was not always, I was not always as confident as I am today. You have to figure out a way to be comfortable with who you are. When you get comfortable with who you are, your confidence will soar. I promise you, your, your confidence will soar. You're all got that inside of you. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what skills or qualities do oh, you look okay, for? Okay, so I look for confidence, okay? I look for somebody who's confident. I look for somebody who can speak. I look for somebody who can look me in the eye and shake my hand. I look for somebody who I would put in front of the clients and say, go talk to the clients. That's as equally, if not more important than the technical skill. In many cases, I can teach you what technical skill you need, right? I can teach you how to look up a code section or I can teach you what the new gap says. You guys know what, uh, you know, all of that. Was it 483? Don't ask me. I don't know. I, I, I'm not a, I'm not, what is it for? What's new? I'm talking about the new rent crap you got to do. 482. <laughs> 482, there you go. <laughs> See, it doesn't matter. I know there's a new rule, but it doesn't really matter. Honestly, it doesn't matter. But you know why? You're laughing at me. Because I can go look it up, or I can ask Anthony. He knows the answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking a little bit. <laughs> you have to be technical. But the reality is, is that that personality is really important at the same time. Yeah, I think you mentioned confidence. That's really important. How about being prepared for your interview? Is that important? Oh, absolutely. Well, I think that's what makes you confident, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. If you're if you're prepared and you just spend look at I actually have notes, right? We haven't I haven't gotten to we any of them yet, but I got notes. <laughs> um, but if you're <laughs> but if you're prepared and you go in and you know about the company and you can talk about yourself, right? Talk about yourself. Talk about the company. Talk. Think about where you want to be. Here's, you want a recommendation? I got a recommendation for all of you, okay? When you go on an interview, think of it differently than you were probably trained to think about it. Don't go on the interview just for them, to, the company to interview you. Go on the interview for you to interview the company. Okay? I'm not saying be obnoxious about it. Don't be obnoxious. But ask them questions. Could you tell me about what the what what's the strategic plan for this organization? Where are you guys going? What are you going to do? What areas are growing really well for you? You want to be come across as confident, as somebody who's prepared. Those are the types of questions that will make anybody look up and go, "Holy smokes, this person really, really has an interest in their own career." Not every single firm has the same approach, the same economics, the same outcome that you can, that you can uh, gain there. Do you want to be on Mr. Ed? You don't even know who Mr. Ed is. You're running <laughs> a race. Do you want to be on, do you guys know who Mr. Ed is? Yeah, I, that I one's do. gone, yeah. Let me see if I can get a different analogy. <laughs> Do you want to be on the slow horse running around the track or you want to be on the fast horse running around the track? It's hard to tell from the outside. You got to ask questions. So let me give you a real world example that happened with my son on this very, very topic. So Alan and I were catching up earlier. I told him some of you know because you've been in my classes that I have a son in law school. So he was interviewing for a big New York law school, big New York law firm job. And he called me one day and said, Dad, I need some good questions that I need to ask some of the folks that I'm going to be meeting with. And so I didn't know anything. Oh, I, I had worked with this firm that he was interviewing with, but I didn't know a lot about them. So I went to the website, and I looked at the website, and I noticed that 
some of the partners, and I won't get too technical, but some of the partners had designated themselves in a certain way and others had not, presumably for tax reasons and legal liability reasons. And I said to him, you know, Nathaniel, it's really interesting that some have set up, per, you know, personal corporations and others didn't. Seems like an interesting question to ask when you're meeting with the partners, right? Because some of the partners he was meeting with had designated themselves that way and others had not. And so he went into this meeting and after they asked him all the questions, he had an opportunity to ask questions. And he said, you know, I'm just curious as to, you know, I met with one of your other partners and they had designated themselves this way and you didn't. So can you help me understand why that's the case? What does it do for you? And they were kind of blown away. They're like, wow, this kid really spent some time understanding and is thinking not just about what's going to happen tomorrow, but what's going to happen out in the future. And so uh, you have to do something to distinguish yourself, right? And so the partners that he met with were really intrigued by that, uh, and he got the job, right? So he's got an internship with a big New York law firm next year, and hopefully he's going to pay for me. Uh, but it's just an example of what Alan's saying and how important is that? Uh, because if you're going to go to work for somebody, you're going to work for a long time, right? You have to be comfortable working there. So you should, you should understand something about them before you commit to that, right? And how are you going to do that? By learning about the business and, and asking questions. Don't be afraid to ask those questions. Don't. Don't. E if, even, if they, even if they get insulted because you ask the question, what does that prove to you? Not the right place, hundred percent. I'm gonna make this a little practical, Alan. Can I ask another practical question? Do you check your emails? I not while I'm speaking. No, but do you check them? <laughs> do you still rely on email to conduct business? Of course. Of course, right? So, uh, in my syllabus, for those that are in my class, I say in there, you need. I'm gonna communicate with you via email. And you need to respond timely and professionally. And people ask me why. And I say, because that's the way business is done, right? It's still done that way, despite what Alan talked about, of building uh, relationships. And you meet, need to meet people in person. Lots of things still happen via email. And so that's why I ask my students to check their emails. There's a lot of, a lot of folks in this room don't check emails. Yeah, right? you got you to gotta check your email. <laughs> the other thing is you, you need to um, LinkedIn has really become the source of validation, right? Um, when I meet somebody new for the first time, I go to LinkedIn and I look at their profile. And I look at their profile to see if they're actually real, right? And what they're, and, and then who's connected? <clears throat> Who do I know that, that, that uh, Tyler knows, right? And what happens is that starts to create validation for you. So keeping your LinkedIn um, putting good posts. Don't put dumb posts in LinkedIn. Um, don't put your telephone number in LinkedIn. Don't do that. Anything you don't want other people to know, don't put it on. Don't, I'm telling you, don't put it on the internet. It'll bite you in the rear end one of these days. But the stuff that you want from a business standpoint, put it there. Put your accolades there. Um, put your accomplishments there. Connect with other people in the business community. Every time you meet somebody, connect with them in the business community. It'll help a lot as you build your, kind of build who you are. How many of you have LinkedIn profiles? That's good. How many are you going to send me an invite here in the next, uh, there you go. <laughs> For those of you who don't have LinkedIn profiles, you should get them, right? It's really important, Yeah. as Alan said. So, Alan, what other words of wisdom do you have? All right. So you want my, uh, my words of wisdom here? Okay, you ready? Number one is know the game that you're playing. Okay? You guys don't know what game you're playing yet. The game that you're playing, if you stay in this industry, is all about clients. Okay? And being able to collect and service those clients is going to create power for you. So... Come out of school, you're not going to have all that. Come out of school, you're going to learn. You're literally, as, as, <laughs> as, as you know, what you learn in school is great as a foundation, but you almost instantaneously take it up 10 notches the day that you start working. You're not expected at any firm to know exactly what you're doing. So you're going to learn as much as you can right out of the box. But the game is... 
to ultimately get to the clients and to be the main person for those clients because that's what creates power and what creates power creates money for you. Number two is to actually understand what that path to success is in whatever organization that you're in, okay? So how do I get from here to here to here to here to here? If an organization can't explain to you how to do that, you're in the wrong organization. I promise. So did you do that? Yes. Did you plan out? when you were the managing partner of the White Plains office, that X number of years I was going to be the president and then I was going to be the CEO? No, I, I, I knew I was going to kill off Cooperman at some... No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the, the president was just a functional thing to get to the, to the CEO. The actual election to the CEO was while I was actually the managing partner of White Plains, and then, they, and then it was just a transition thing to get there, the presidency thing. But... I knew what it took, yes. Did I know I was going to be the person? No, I did not. But I knew what I had to do in order to get there, and there was multiple people that were qualified to do it. I just, I don't know, worked harder, whatever it was. But I knew how to get there. That's number two. Number three, <clears throat> this is the hardest probably one, to be honest with you, is understand who you are and what you need to change. We all need to change, and you all will continue to change as you go through your lives. The person I am today I wasn't 10 years ago, and the person I am 10 years ago was not the person I was in college, and the person I was in college was not the person I was in high school, right? We all keep evolving and changing. And if you know who you are, and you know what you're trying to attain, you can actually shape yourself with the help of mentors and others, but you can actually shape yourself to be who you're looking to be, okay? Without losing your personality and everything else. So that's the, the, the next, right? Is actually work on changing yourself. That could mean that I need to develop my, personal, my personal skills, how I speak or how I write or you know, how I communicate with people. It's not just the technical things that you know. You need to be that well-rounded person. And you know, we're not talking, we've not talked tonight about any of the tax laws or GAP or anything else. We're talking about how you develop as a person. Number five, I said this a couple of times, you need to show up. It's really critical. And when I say show up, I mean participate. Participate in life, participate in the firm that you're working at, participate in the activities that you're doing, participate in your community. All of those relationships will come back to you a million fold as you get, as you get older and more mature. You need to be organized and accurate in this profession. And as technology continues to affect us, it's going to become even more important, that organization. I see a lot of young people, and they're not organized. It's hard to, it's, it's, this profession's really hard to operate effectively in unless you're organized and you have yourself, you got your routines down, right? And then um, last two, listen. Always listen. Be a good listener. Doesn't mean you need to do everything, but you need to listen. And if you don't understand what somebody's telling you, ask. I swear I'm on calls, and this is true. And I'll go, I don't know what you just said. And they'll be like, he's a CEO, and he doesn't know what the hell. I, I have no idea what you just said to me. I have no idea. You just used initials. I have no idea what they mean. Zero. And it doesn't come from a place... <laughs> I'm not being obnoxious. It comes from a place of, I want to understand. I don't want to let anything go past me without understanding what the other person's trying to tell me. So listening's really important. And then the last, and this is what I tell my kids all the time. You could be the smartest. You could be the brightest. You could be the, the, the biggest personality in the room. You could have everything you want to have. If you don't execute, you have nothing. If you say, I'm going to do this, do it. Most of the world does not. Most of the world says they're going to do something, and they actually don't do it. I feel like I'm on a Nike commercial. <laughs>
Just do it. But it's true. If you say I'm going to do something, you got to do it. You can't be successful by just yesing people to death. That's what I got for you, John. And if you make a mistake, you deal with it, right? Like you and said you, before. You're going to make mistakes. Right. You're going to. Absolutely. Be so, comfortable with it. So I'm going to ask one more question, and I'm going to open it up, because I want to go back. You've been spending a lot of time talking about how hard you worked and how focused you were, and obviously that helped you get where you are today. But how do you deal with striking a balance between your personal and professional life? Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, so I was, I, I'm very lucky. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm really lucky. Number one is I have an unbelievably great family. And they helped me to, to do everything that I did. But I will tell you that I also never missed out on anything with my kids. I coached. I coached baseball from the time we were doing eight U's up until, you know, 13 U's. So I coached travel baseball uh, in Mayapac <laughs> uh, all the way through, um, which was wonderful. I coached my daughter's softball team. I w went to all of their recitals and all their ballet, you know, all the everything under the sun I went to, and it was wonderful. So striking that balance is, is actually better now than it was before. It's actually easier now than it was before because flexibility has come into all of our lives, especially with COVID and, and all of this stuff. But you need, to have, um, you need to have that solid foundation behind you. That's what allows you to get there ultimately. So I can't tell you how to do that because only you and your family eventually are going to be able to figure that out for you. But I would tell you that having a family that's aligned in terms of what you want to what you want to accomplish is is important. It's very important. That's that's when I see divorce, quite frankly, happen more often than not because you know one spouse wants to accomplish something and the other spouse may not want to accomplish something and they're not aligned as to where they're going together. So I really appreciate you guys coming tonight. I hope you got something out of it. Alan, I know I did. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your time and, and your insights uh, with all of our students. I really appreciate it. If you want to connect with me on, on uh, I was going to say Instagram, but don't connect with me on Instagram. <laughs> I don't post anything on Instagram. I just used to watch my kids. But if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you ever have any questions, just reach out to me. I'm happy to help you guys, okay? All right. Have Thanks a good night. Again, Alan. <laughs>